What evil thing have you done to make dogs hate you? Ah, yes, now I remember. As a boy in Mexico, I was captured by the Aztecs. Our favorite holiday dish was baked dog. I must say it was quite good. Good morning, everyone. This is Stone Gasman, live from New York City. And this morning, uh, we are going to be doing an audio commentary for Daughters of Satan. And yes, uh, Tom Selleck is not on the cover, but yeah, he is actually the star of this movie. It's actually his second movie, believe it or not. Now, revealed on the screen, a secret cult of lust-craved witches torturing their victims with fire and desire. Now... <laughs> I chose this one for a couple of reasons. First off, uh, that I am a fan of Tom Selleck. Um, of course, I feel weird saying that because I don't think I've ever seen a full episode of Magnum P.I., but I've seen a lot of his movies. Uh, and so I wanted to get this, but also because I kind of have a fetish for witch cinema. I mean, in 2016, uh, I thought the two number one films that year were a tie between Robert Eggers' The Witch, and Anna Biller's The Love Witch. And uh, that year also Blair Witch, it didn't even crack the top 50, just to let everybody know. Uh, but I do love witch films, and I, and, I, and I think among the werewolves and the vampires and all that good stuff, I think my favorite is absolutely witches. So when I realized this was a movie about a witch's coven with Tom Selleck, I, I realized I got to pick this up, and I got to do this. Of course, I wasn't expecting anything great, but I was expecting, I actually found out that this is a lot worse than I expected. But anyway, uh, we're going to we're gonna go ahead and get started here. We are paused on the United Artists logo. Yeah, this movie was not released by American International Pictures. It was United Artists of all studios. So um, anyway, uh, let me just say hi real quick to Rob Gasper in the chat. I got it via screen pick streaming app, FYI, but couldn't find it anywhere else. Yeah, that's why I got the Blu-ray, because, um, I mean, if it was streaming, I would have just streamed it. But uh, because I don't like picking up Blu-ray, I don't have bonus features. I kind of have a thing about that. And Daughters of Satan, unfortunately, this Blu-ray only has uh, 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 a photo gallery and trailers, which isn't much to uh, shout about. But at any rate... Uh, and then uh, uh, Cliff Booth, sexy young Tom Selleck. My mother would love this movie. <laughs> Maybe. Hey, uh, Cliff, if you want my copy when we're done, just send me your uh, email address and, or your address via email and I'll, I'll ship it out to you. <laughs> so Because I'm probably not going to end up keeping this. But um, at any rate, uh, let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, we are paused on the United Artists logo and uh, we will start on three, two, one and play. And yes, that is the United Artists logo from the early 1970s. Entertainment from Trans America Corporation. You know, I don't think I've done a United Artists film all year. That's really weird. I mean, usually for these 50th anniversary commentaries, I try to cover like something from every studio. Um but yeah, uh, not, not in this case, evidently. So uh, here we are with Daughters of Satan. Uh, the title just, you know, flashed already. And uh, uh, okay, so there's this um, uh, Filipino woman being raised by one arm. Uh, her, uh, a rope is tied around her, uh, I think her right arm. And she's basically being hung over uh, a bunch of... Um, metal spikes <laughs> and all these uh you know filipinos are kind of watching uh except for one uh white woman who just whips uh this other woman who's already been whipped you know several times and she's naked you know she's obviously being tortured one of the um uh one of the spikes is already going through her foot and everything and uh let me go ahead and turn on the subtitles here <laughs> Lucifer, our Lord. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, here we uh, go already with this witch's coven where they're, you know, I guess trying to uh, Beelzebub, Prince of Flies. Yeah, that's yeah, that's the level of dialogue in this movie. Remember, this came out before uh, The Exorcist. <laughs> You know, and everybody's just like watching and the dog. Oh, my God. We're, we're going to talk about the dog. There's a dog just sitting there watching this whole 
uh, uh, spectacle. <laughs> and uh, as we will later find out, uh, this dog has a spiked collar with uh, the number 666 embedded on it. <laughs> yeah, very, very subtle. Very subtle. And uh, here we go. Uh, then uh, fade in on Tom Selleck in the present day. Literally, his his name just uh, popped up on screen, driving this um, fancy schmancy red car, and <laughs> and he's basically driving around Manila. Now, what is Tom Selleck doing in Manila? Where? Well, he's an art art dealer, and uh, you know, I guess he's just over in Manila just to uh, you know collect art and everything. I mean, you know, he obviously has a good amount of money to be living over there. And, uh, you know, he's married and, you know, he has a wife, but no kids yet. Um, it's really weird. This movie, uh, I mean, in the movie, he's supposed to be 29 years old. But in reality, he was actually, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, it's actually says in the movie that, that his character was born in 1943. So if you do the math, he would be 29. But Tom Selleck actually wasn't born until uh 1947. So in reality, uh, he's about 25 years old right here. And like I said, only his second movie. His uh, first movie was actually um, Myra Breckenridge, which I should have dug out of my uh, DVD collection because uh, he's actually, um, no, excuse me, not Myra Breckenridge. I, I always get it confused with, uh, uh, is it Myra Breckenridge? Maybe it is. I thought it was... Uh, it might have been Sextet, but that didn't come out until uh, 78, I thought. Oh, he, he plays one of Mae West's uh, studs in... Uh, oh. Myra Breckenridge. Oh, so I was right. <laughs> it was Myra Breckenridge. I, kept on, I keep on getting that confused with Sextet for some reason. Uh, he actually was in Sextet. He was one of Mae's... Um, studs in that i believe but um yeah his first film was myra breckenridge where he played a stud and now he plays the character of james robertson here sporting a blue shirt uh and looking at some uh, paintings in a manila art shop and um <laughs> so i gotta i gotta confess right now my first viewing of this was largely what the fuck <laughs> You know, I, I mean, as my good friend John over at Twitter told me via a uh, direct message, you know, this, this feels like, uh, uh, somebody just, uh, uh, making a house payment <laughs> with this movie. <laughs> well, actually this is some lovely artwork and, uh, Tom Selleck actually gets, uh, enamored by this painting with, uh, three witches getting burned and um, you can't really see it right now, but there's actually a Spanish uh, conquistador actually watching all this take place in the painting. And he looks at the uh, the woman in the middle of the three witches that are being burned, evidently. And wouldn't you know, uh, it reminds him of his wife. And so he decides to um, pick the painting up and give it to her, which is really weird. I mean, I, I don't know. If you were married... Uh, and you recognize your wife in a in a painting uh, as a witch being burned to death. I mean, would you buy it for your wife? I mean, that's just really weird. I don't know. I mean, unless you know your wife has a a, white, a, a witch fetish like me, I, I don't understand why anybody would get that for their significant other. It's just it feels a little too weird. I mean, I you know, no matter what you believe in terms of the occult or anything, you know, it's funny. Uh, we did Blackula. And uh, Scream Black with Scream on Saturday night, a great double feature. And I, and one of my favorite parts of Blackula is uh, when uh, the uh, when they ask him in the in the in the club, you know, so how do you feel about the cult? And like he says something to the effect, "Oh, it's like mildly fascinating." You know, it's it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, re really, uh, you know, really keeping your cover on, <laughs> really. <laughs> but Tom Selleck, look, I like Tom Selleck a lot as an actor. I mean, you know, granted, he hasn't really, he hasn't won a lot of awards. But, I mean, the thing is, is that whenever he's in a movie, I mean, he always seems to improve the movie. Now, admittedly, and this is just me, 
this is just me, but I've always kind of wondered what Raiders of the Lost Ark would have been had Tom Selleck been cast as Indiana Jones, because of course he was the he was actually the front runner. Uh, if you don't know the story, basically George Lucas said, you know, well Stephen wanted Stephen wanted um, Harrison. And George Lucas said, oh, come on. He's already been in two of my movies. I don't want him to be my Bobby De Niro. Well, actually, Mr. Lucas, he actually was in three of your movies. Because not only was he in uh, American Graffiti and, uh, well, actually four. Uh, because he was in the two American Graffiti movies and the two Star Wars movies that, you know, remember Raiders came out in 81. And like I said, I, you know, nothing against Harrison. He, he's the quintessential Indiana Jones I still kind of wonder what what Raiders would have looked like with Tom Selleck. What would it would it have been the as big a box office hit? Probably not. I mean, because like I said, Tom Selleck wasn't exactly a big box office draw at the time. But you can completely understand why uh, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg were seriously considering him. And uh, if you look online, and also like on the physical media. Uh, releases of the Indiana Jones trilo uh, quadrilogy, excuse me, uh, soon to be quintet. Uh, uh, you'll actually see a lot of um, uh, shooting footage, you know, audition footage of uh, Selleck, uh, you know, doing Indiana Jones. And I think he's, you know, perfectly good for the part. I mean, like I said, if he wasn't attached to Magnum PI, you know, because he was already contracted to do the show at that point, you know, he would have been Indiana Jones. And I kind of always wonder what if. Here he is just grabbing his wife's ass as he comes in. Uh, hey, honey, let me show you this painting that I got. You know, well, first, uh, you know, first you got to must me. I always think of uh, Kim Novak in Vertigo. <laughs> when, when she goes up to Jimmy Stewart, is like, please must me a little. You know, <laughs> even, even when I was a kid, I was like, what the hell does must mean? Oh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And she's like, oh, the fuck? <laughs> yeah, director Hollingsworth Morse just likes to zoom in on that painting. You know, like, yes, this is what she's looking at. Well, of course she's looking at the, the witch in the middle. What are you talking about? And she's obviously uh, kind of intimidated by this. Why would you bring this home? Tom, what the hell were you thinking? <laughs> No, no, no. There's just something about it. <laughs> uh, you should have just left it alone, Tom. Because, well, of course, we'd have no movie, but, you know, so be it. <laughs> did, you, did you really have to pick up this painting? Did you really have to pick it up and give it to your wife? Really? Uh, yeah. But um, going back to Tom Selleck for a minute, because, um, well, you know, most people know him as uh, Magnum P.I. And, you know, I probably should watch the entire series of Magnum P.I. at some point. Uh, but he actually started out in television in 1969 when he did episodes of Lancer and Judd for the Defense. And then in uh, uh, he did a television movie in 1970 called The Movie Murderer. <laughs> Sounds a little... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a little obvious there. Um, and then he did episodes of, you know, Sarge and uh, Wide World Mystery, the FBI, Marcus Welby, MD. Um, a couple of more TV movies like A Case of Rape and Returning Home. Uh, and then he was on uh, The Young and the Restless for like a whole year. I mean, he actually did uh, the soap opera Young, Young and the Restless for 74 to 75 for a whole year. And he actually returned for a guest spot in 2005, believe it or not. So he obviously walked away with, from that show with some, uh, you know, nostalgia or affection. In 1975, he also did episodes of Marcus Welby, N.D., Mannix and the Streets of San Francisco with Michael Douglas. And uh, later on, he was in an episode of Taxi. And then he did uh, several episodes of The Rockford Files with uh, James Garner. And then he did Magnum P.I., which, of course, he did all 162 episodes over the course of eight years from uh, 1980 to 1988. Um and, the, and of course, you know, he did other stuff like Muppet Babies and Murder, She Wrote and, uh, you know, uh, stuff like that. Uh, Boston Legal. What's the other show that he's been doing that 
uh, is it? Oh, Blue Bloods. Yeah, that's what it is. He's the main role on Blue Bloods. And I've never seen that show either, but uh, he plays uh, NYPD Police Commissioner Frank Reagan. Yeah. Oh, and he's also known for these Jesse Stone movies, which I've I've never seen them. I've never seen these Jesse Stone movies, but I can't help but think that, you know, uh, you know, my mother would love those movies. I remember I worked at a video store in California and those Jesse Stone movies were always rented. Like always. I mean, it's amazing. You know, people love Tom Selleck. And, you know, now as far as movies are concerned, because you got to remember he's primarily a television star, not a film star. But after Daughters of Satan, he did Terminal Island, 1973, Midway in 76. In 1978, he did Coma, Superdome, and the Gypsy Warriors. And then while he was doing uh, Magnum P.I., he uh, actually uh, uh, did his first big film uh, called High Road to China, which is actually not too bad. And then in 1984, he did a couple movies that I actually really like. Uh, Lasseter with Jane Seymour, a really good little James Bond type of movie. And also Runaway, where he plays this uh, this cop who goes after you know futuristic robots that, robots that have gone bad. And the villain in that movie is none other than Gene Simmons. Uh, from Kiss, and I, I tell you right now, you know, check out Runaway if you haven't, because look, Tom Selleck versus Gene Simmons is just you know cinema gold. Now I must, I, I got to raise my volume for just a minute. This is too good not to uh, show you guys real quick, and I'm actually going to actually turn the camera over just so you can see this because it, it's too good. Uh, it's too good. But um, he's about to go to his bedside table. You know, he's going to his wife and, you know, what's wrong? What are you looking out the window for? And, you know, everything. Uh, but this is too good. You have to check this out. Oh, Don't want to pull out uh, too much, but this is too good not to show you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, he actually says the word Magnum on screen there. That was, that was awesome. You know, talk about uh, prof uh, uh, prophetic. <laughs> but that, look, that was just too good. I had to show you all that. <laughs> How prophetic, right? <clears throat> really? Yeah. He actually calls it a Magnum. Now, after uh, Lassiter and Runaway, he also did Three Men and a Baby, which was, believe it or not, that was the number one box office hit of 1987. Really hard to believe, because I don't think it's well remembered or remembered with any great affection, but massive hit. It was actually the biggest hit of his career. And then, he, of course, he did a sequel called Three Men and a Little Lady. In uh, 1989, he did a couple of, uh, you know, decent films, Her Alibi and An Innocent Man. Um, yep. And, uh, then in 1990, he did Quigley Down Under, which is actually one of his most beloved films, actually. It's a really good Western, uh, filmed and set in Australia. <clears throat> and then, uh, in 1992, he did two terrible, terrible, terrible movies, uh, Folks with Don Amici and Christopher Columbus, The Discovery, where he actually dresses up like King Ferdinand V and seems the most embarrassed that he's ever been on screen. In fact, he was even nominated for a Razzie Award for that. I don't know if that's particularly fair, but yeah, that's what happened. But uh, the only decent film he did in 1992 was Mr. Baseball, which I saw it. It was fine. You know, nothing to write home about. It's not really one of the best baseball movies. But look, Tom Selleck's uh, charm is always, always there. But if you ask me, my favorite uh, Tom Selleck performance, hands down, in a movie is the 1997 movie 
and out where uh, you know Matt Dillon he wins an, uh, an Academy Award and in a in a spoof of the whole Tom Oscars uh, thanking his uh, drama teacher for uh, for being gay speech well that's what Matt Dillon does to Kevin Klein he says to the entire world you know thanking him for being his English teacher and that he's gay and Tom Selleck is a reporter who comes into town to actually cover everything uh, you know, because, you know, now, you know, reporters are, are all everywhere. They want to interview Kevin Klein. And as we find out, Tom Selleck is gay. And uh, he and <clears throat> Kevin Klein, they share a kiss that goes on for like 20 seconds. It, it's one of the it's one of the funniest things in the movie. I mean, I, I remember when I uh, watched it with a lot of guys in the Navy. And of course, you know, a, a couple of them kind of cringed and yet they still laughed. They still laughed. I mean, look, you know, here they are kissing for like a good 20, 25 seconds of screen time. And Tom Selleck is wonderful in that. Yeah, John Cus uh, Joan Cusack actually got the Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actress. Oh, but man, Tom Selleck was so, so good in that. But after In and Out, he only did a few other films. I mean, he did The Love Letter, Meet the Robinsons. Uh, Meet Dave, that horrible Eddie Murphy movie. And his last movie was actually uh, Killers, uh, another terrible movie with Katherine Heigl and Ashton Kutcher. So he's made his fair share of bad movies. Uh, a lot of them in the 80s I actually do have a fondness for, uh, particularly Lassiter and Runaway. Like I said, if you're a Selleck fan, check out Lassiter and Runaway, particularly Lassiter. That, that, I mean, nobody talks about Lassiter. Nobody talks about that movie. Um, and so here we have the dog, you know, coming back. He's got the 666, you know, spiked collar and everything. And uh, <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. There's not much of a plot to this movie. I mean, there really isn't. I mean, Tom Selleck picks up this fucking painting, which uh, has, you know, a witch on it that looks exactly like his wife. And, of course, a lot of weird shit starts to happen. This dog shows up out of nowhere. And, uh, you know, even though the dog is very nice to her, you know, the dog acts like he wants to bite off Tom Selleck's uh, mustache or whatever. You know, it just, you know and, it, and, and soon we find out that, you know, there are a couple of other witches. The, the other two witches in the painting will eventually, you know... It, what happened to them after they got burned and somehow they got in their souls got into these 20th century women. I can't really explain that, but, and, and Tom Selleck is supposed to, uh, you know, supposedly this uh, Spanish con the, the Spanish conquistador in the painting. Actually, you see him hanging the painting right now and he, and uh, him as the Spanish con uh, conquistador is all the way to the right. Um, and he's just basically looking at the witches as they're being burned, but we don't see his face uh in the painting and of course now he notices that oh my god there's some shit going on here the dog that was in the painting no longer in the painting so you have to assume that the dog actually kind of jumped out of the painting and now you know the the dog is now you know going after Selleck and his wife um uh, and soon uh Selleck's wife is going to be possessed hey Dan how you doing uh hope you're having an awesome Halloween season I am sir uh, you've been rocking it with the commentaries. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Shine. I so uh, appreciate that. Yeah, like I said, I mean, this weekend I'm going to be doing six. Uh, you know, two on Saturday night, two on Sunday night, two on Monday night. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait. Uh, particularly today, I'm supposed to get the, the book version of The Possession of Joel Delaney. And I'm going to have 48 hours to read it before the uh, commentary on, sa on a Saturday night at uh, 8 p.m. Or 9 p.m., excuse me. So, um, but I mean, Leonard Malton in his uh, movie and video guide gave this movie two stars. And I think that's a little bit generous, uh, to be perfectly honest. Look, it, even if you're the most hardcore Tom Selleck fan, this is a tough sell. Uh, this is a really tough sell. I mean, yeah, sure, he looks good. He's young, you know, and, you know, and, and of course he appears with his shirt off quite a bit, you know, which is always a, a benefit. Uh, but the thing is, is that it, his performance is just really flat. It he, Honestly, half the time he seems rather utterly confused. And like other times he's just uh, basically like, am I really reading this dialogue? He actually looks up for a minute while he's, just, you know, saying this line right here. There And there's moments like that throughout. Like 
I'm really doing a movie called Daughters of Satan. But look, if you're the star, you know, I don't blame him for, for taking the role if he's going to be the star. So that's what I'm saying. You got to remember, he had only done Myra Breckenridge, which I do have on DVD, by the way. But he only did that. He only played a stud in it. I don't even know if he had a line in it. Uh, in this movie, you know, he's the lead. And of course, you know, how, you know, how can you turn down a lead role when you're 25 years old, even if it's for a movie called Daughters of Satan? <laughs> and so now he's uh, making out with his wife a little bit more. And uh, so let's talk about the director of this movie. Uh, the director of uh, Daughters of Satan is a guy by the name of uh, Hollingsworth Morse. Uh, yes, that's his name. And he didn't do a lot of movies. Uh, I think um, he actually did a Disney movie the same year as this. Uh, just real quick. And yes, I'm going to talk about her in a minute that just arrived, who's going to be the housekeeper uh, for a very brief amount of time. Uh, but Hollingsworth Morse, he was born on December 16th, 1910 in L.A. He was a director and assistant director known for Rocky Jones, Space Ranger, Zorro, the Guy Williams version of Zorro uh, from Disney, and Richard Diamond, private detective. He was previously married to Sally Ellers and Sandra Gold, and he died on January 23rd, 1988 in Studio City. Not a lot about, not a lot, uh, about him. I even tried looking at other, other sources, and I really couldn't find anything. But it looks like uh, his career as a director, he's got 86 credits. Uh, a lot of it is in television. Uh, yeah, The Adventures of J uh, Jim Bowie, The Texan, The Great Ghost, you know, stuff like that. Uh, in the 60s, he did uh, 46 episodes of McHale's Navy. All right. Yeah, he did four, 46 episodes of that. Uh, he did uh, six episodes of F Troop. Ten episodes of The New Adventures of Huckleberry Finn in the late 1960s. Oh, that's really interesting. Interesting. Uh, the Virginian, he did a couple episodes of that, uh, the DA, uh, the Disney movie that he directed the same year as Daughters of Satan was a, a movie called Justin Morgan Had a Horse, uh, which is actually based on a kind of a beloved book about, a about the first American bred horse, uh, the Morgan horse. It's a movie that starred Don Murray and Whit Bissell. Uh, I've never seen it, uh, but I mean, it's kind of, I think it's one of the more rare, uh, Disney movies. Uh, but he also did 11 episodes of Shazam. And he also did uh, 16 episodes of Operation Petticoat. 17 episodes of the Dukes of Hazard, And then finally, his last uh, 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 directorial work was for The Fall Guy. He did 11 episodes of The Fall Guy. And I, I will say, I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of The Fall Guy. I mean, I watched it in the late 80s, early 90s. Sure, you know, Lee Majors, I get it. You know, I, I love that theme song. For the fall guy I, it's one of my favorite theme songs you know well i i'm not the one to kiss and tell but i've been with farah you know i love that I, and, and lee majors actually sung that song which is even more amazing um but yeah that's basically uh hollingsworth morse's career in a nutshell i mean he really didn't do uh a lot i mean just a uh, some disney stuff and he did a lot of episodes of you know shows that i just mentioned but um certainly not a well-known director uh certainly not a well-known director at all yep hey hello again dan hey cliff and ben grim 2 a.m in nyc yes yes absolutely uh this i I, th I think this is more than the appropriate time to do a uh audio commentary for daughters of satan <laughs> yeah uh okay so we're coming up on the 26 minute mark just to let everybody know 26 minute mark and this is only a 90 minute movie i mean that's the thing is that the best thing i can say about this movie is that i wasn't bored i actually wanted to find out what happened at the end uh i you know here again i was just uh, kind of massively disappointed i mean here again you know Selleck looks great uh his performance is not great and okay so the woman who plays uh his wife right here a uh, very beautiful woman uh, she actually later uh, became a writer. You know, she actually wrote a few movies. Uh, 
But uh, her name is uh, Bera Grant. Uh, she is still with us. Uh, I don't know how old she is, but uh, I think in this movie she looks about Tom's age, probably 24, 25. Um, super fine, if you ask me. Uh, but uh, she's only done four movies. She only did four movies. Uh, she did uh, Daughters of Satan. It Ain't Easy. She did that the same year in uh, 1972 with uh, Lance Henriksen, of all people. Uh, yeah. And then she did uh, Mother Jugs and Speed uh, as uh, Miss Crocker. And then finally, uh, she wrote and and uh, had a role in Slow Dancing in the Big City. She actually wrote that movie. It was produced by L Lloyd Kaufman and directed by John G. Avildsen, who did Rocky and The Karate Kid and, you know, other movies like that. And that movie starred Paul Sorvino. But she actually wrote the script for that. And then later on, she worked in television. I mean, she did um, actually the same year as uh, Daughters of Satan. She did an episode of uh, the Mary Tyler Moore show, which I honestly think is the finest show of the 1970s, hands down. But she also did a uh, Love American Style, Gunsmoke, Trapped Beneath the Sea, a few more television movies. And... Um, she wrote a couple of other things. She actually directed one episode of uh, the Dirty Dancing spinoff for television in the late 1980s. And she also did uh, several episodes. Uh, well, she wrote several episodes and was an executive consultant uh, for Living Single. Yeah, we all remember that show. And then uh, in 2005 and 2009, she did two more movies that she actually wrote and directed. Uh, one of them was Life of the Party with uh, Clifton Collins Jr. and Pamela Reed and uh, Larry Miller. And uh, her last movie for 2009 was uh, Love Hurts, uh, which she wrote and directed, and it stars Richard E. Grant, Carrie Ann Moss, and Johnny Picard. So she later became a writer and a director, you know, no, no longer doing movies like Daughters of Satan. <laughs> but... Um, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, I can't deny that both Tom Selleck and Barra Grant look great in this movie. And, uh, well, also, I also, I mean, well, I mean, I think two out of the three witches look amazing, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm always, uh, you know, I have a weak spot for hot witches in movies, you know. <laughs> um, probably my favorite being uh, Samantha Robinson and the Love Witch. <clears throat> Um, now, we saw the housekeeper. Now, th this is very, very interesting. Um, her full name, and get ready for this. Her full name is uh, Sigrid Sophia Agatha de Torres von Gies, better known by her screen name, which is Paralumen. That's P-A-R-A-L-U-M-A-N. And she's actually the witch on the on the uh, right in the painting. Of course, I don't know. I don't think that clicked for me initially. I mean, I knew that the uh, woman from the beginning that was torturing the Filipino woman uh, over the stakes and everything. I mean, I know that she was the, the witch on the left, uh, but I didn't know who the witch was on the right. And and evidently, you know, the woman that plays that witch is Paralumen an award-winning Filipina German actress. Her contemporaries include the likes of Fernando Poe Sr. and Carmen Rosales. She was a major contract player of Sampa, uh, Sampaguida Pictures. She was born in 1923 and passed in uh, 2009 at the age of 85. <clears throat> uh, she, uh, her extraordinary beauty led the 17-year-old Para Lumen to be recommended by another sister of Corazon Noble, Norma, to film producer... Uh, Louis Nolasco. Her first movie was Flores de Mayo, 1940, and she initially used the screen name Mina de Gracia. She was rechristened Paralumen, archaic Tagalog for muse or magnetic needle uh, for Fernando Poe po Sr., uh, and who signed her as a full-fledged star in exotic films, uh, uh, Para Lumen in 1941. So she actually starred in a movie where she adopted her name. This was followed by the actress's roles in the films Bayani Ing Bayan and Putin Dambana. And uh, per, uh, after World War II, she came back to cinema as a contract player of Sampaguida Pictures. Uh, she then became a famous leading lady in romantic movies. But when she made a comeback, her image was re uh, repackaged by Sampaguida owner Dr. Jose Doc. Perez. 
She was given character roles playing nemesis to Gloria Romero in Hong Kong Holiday, then as a disabled woman in Tanakalong Apoi in 1959. She won a FAMAS Best Actress Award for her role in Sino Ang Me Sala. Uh, per, uh, Para Lumen was also nominated by FAMAS four times, twice in 1959 for Best Actress for the movies Bobby and Anino Ni Bathala. In 1972, as Best Supporting Actress for Lillette, that was the same year as uh, Daughters of Satan, obviously. And in 1976, as Best Supporting Actress for Mr. Mo, Lover Boy Co. Her last films were Viva Films' Kala, Kalyan Sasha Bihing Mahakita in 1985, and Envy Productions' Tatlong Ina Isang Anak in 1987, as one of the spinster ants of Miguel Rodriguez. Paralumen had her first marriage to Yoshifume Abe that ended in divorce. She remarried in December 1949 in Manila to airline pilot Anthony Joseph Tony Barreto O'Brien, who was the son of Peter O'Brien and Dolores Barreto E. Barreto of Zambales. Baby O'Brien, who was her daughter by her first marriage to Abe, took the surname of her stepfather and was herself a television actress and commercial model. O'Brien's daughter, Rena Reyes, is also an actress. She sadly died of cardiac arrest on April 27, 2009, at her home in Paranac uh, Paranaque, uh, which is a first-class, highly urbanized city in the national capital region of the Philippines. She was, so she was actually a pretty big uh, Filipino actress for a number of years. And uh, she did over 50 films. In fact, in 1964, she did another movie called Moro Witch Doctor. <laughs> so, so she's no stranger to witch movies, apparently. What is this movie about? CIA agent Jefferson Stark is ordered to the Philippines to investigate the double homicide of two American plantation owners. Authorities believe the two were killed as a result of local gun smuggling and drug dealing. Okay. And uh, she plays the role of Celise Noble. Yeah. But we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see Para, uh, Para Lumen again uh, a bit later. I mean, like I said, she's not in this film much, but, uh, uh, but she, um, yeah. Oh, Jamie, always wonderful to see you. Hope you're doing well. How's my favorite roofing stud, <laughs> Cliff? <laughs> Awesome. I'm not sure what that means, but that's a great. You fun stream you had tonight, by the way. Awesome. Awesome. Um, <laughs> but Jamie, uh, wonderful to see you come out tonight. Uh, you know, uh, we are actually in uh, watching Daughters of Satan and we are coming up on 34 minutes and 30 seconds. So we're just over the third of the way mark. And uh, Tom Selleck is now basically, <laughs> yeah, this is really, really weird. <laughs> Taking a picture of uh, this uh, Filipino woman that was, you know, hung over spikes, you know, by one arm, uh, topless. And now her face is like, you know, completely molded over and everything. And this guy is like taking a picture of her. It's really weird. It's just really, really weird. Um, a dog's owner, a dog named Nico Demas. Did you know anyone who owns a big dog named Nico Demas? <laughs> God. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's the address. 666 Revolution. Oh, God. I mean... <laughs> All of this dialogue is super trite and super obvious. I mean, okay, we get it. They're witches, and they want to kill Tom Selleck because he, bur he burned them at the stake in 1592 when he was a Spanish conquistador. You know, you know, and, and Tom Selleck actually started this whole thing when he picked up the painting for his wife. I mean, here again, no, I mean, I can't think of anybody that would want to pick up a painting for their wife when she's in the picture being burned at the stake as a witch. I, I, I don't get it at all. But we need we need something to move the story forward, right? Oh, he's trying to identify the dog and see who the dog belongs to and everything. Oh, and walking by a coffin. You know, how, uh, how foreshadowing is that? 
James Robertson, 19, 1943 to 1972. But like I said, he was actually born in 47. And here again, there there's the scenes where he's just walking around Manila, you know, kind of, you know. I mean, we know he's, you know, he's investigating. He's trying to figure out certain things. But, you know, it's like Hollingsworth more. Uh, it, it seems like he filmed all this as padding, you know, just so he can get from uh, one point in the script to another point. Oh, yeah, we'll just have Tom Selleck walk around and look at uh, look at stuff. And then uh, we'll finally have him arrive at 666 revolution street like seriously uh the guy that uh sold him the painting and he unfortunately just got stabbed <laughs> he's looking in the camera i like that <laughs> tom so pushes the body up he's got a a knife you know with bleeding everything and he's when he gets pushed up he's literally looking at the camera like that you know and uh you know, he didn't flinch when he pulled that knife out of his stomach. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> and this chase scene, you know, Tom Selleck just jumps in front of a truck and the driver just is like, oh, whatever. This, you know, this happens all the time. And, uh, you know, this happens all the time in um, Manila, you know. And now he's throwing the boxes at the guy with a knife. He, he threw a giant Marlboro cigarette box at him. Hey, smoking will kill you, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, it's actually two guys chasing him. That's right. But where did the second guy come? Now, that is an insane stunt that happened right there. He literally jumped over a horse, and he ended up on the other, other side underneath the horse. I'm not kidding about that. That was actually one of the coolest things in the movie, is when he jumped over this horse. It was insane. And it probably was him. It might have been a stunt double, obviously. But I don't know. Something tells me Magna, a Magnum P.I. can handle his own stunts. Okay, everything I told you about the dog, the painting fading, one of the witches looks just like my wife, another like our cook, and the art dealer being stabbed to death. I don't know. Have I been hallucinating? <laughs> Troubling factual happenings. Yes, 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 yes. See, it just doesn't go far enough with the schlock, man. I wanted more schlock from this movie. I mean, look, if you're going to be, a, you know, you know, a ridiculous witch coven movie where, you know, Tom Selleck is essentially going to be the victim. And well, OK, now here is the um, here's the other witch right here that we uh, haven't talked about yet. This is um, Tanny Guthrie. And uh, actually, I got to go back here to read more about her. But he, uh, here, uh, here she is. Uh, she's in her early forties here, but very beautiful. Just I don't care for the for the eye shadow and everything. You know the bluish eye shadow. I mean that doesn't really. I don't care for that. But uh, um, you'll see later what uh, what I mean when I say she she actually looks really really good. Uh, but her name is, and she actually went by several different names. She actually. Went by a few. Yeah, her name, at least being billed here, is uh, Tanny Guthrie. And, okay, so she was born in 1928, passed it in uh, 2018 at the age of 89. So she lived a, lived a good, uh, good long life. Uh, let's see. She, in terms of her films uh she's only been in uh she only has 28 credits uh she started out in the 50s in a movie called i the jury uh have i seen that before oh yeah detective mike hammer is determined to catch and kill the person who shot his close friend dead so he follows clues that lead to a beautiful seductive woman uh but she does not play the beautiful seductive woman actually she has a a uh, much smaller part as Esther Bellamy. And yeah, she did it under a different name. But she was also in Greenwich, uh, Greenwich Village Story in 1963, uh, Dragnet 1967, Adam 12. Uh, she had an uncredited role as a record store customer in Cactus Flower, the movie which got uh, Goldie Hawn an Oscar. And uh, she was also in Bonanza, Inside Bracken's World, Medical Center, 
uh, Cactus in the Snow. Yeah, that's actually a name of a movie from uh, 1971. And then she actually did several episodes of Room 222 uh, from 71 to 73. Uh, Canon, Emergency, Heck Ramsey, uh, The Tribe, which was a TV movie. She was also in uh, Bound for Glory, the great Hal Ashby movie, which I also have on Blu-ray, by the way. Uh, she played Woody's California-bound neighbor, Donna Jo. Uh, I think that was one of her bigger roles. And unfortunately, her last role was in 1981 in the adaptation of The Postman Always Rings Twice with uh, Jack Nicholson and... Um, <laughs> her name escapes me now. Uh, from King Kong and uh, Tootsie. Jessica Lang. Jessica Lang. And I must say, I've seen both versions of Postman Rings Twice. I highly, highly prefer uh, the 1946 Lana Turner uh, version. Yeah, see, now, Abby, as you know, she's under, uh, you know, she's basically being possessed now by uh, uh, by help of the other witches, let's put it this way, that she's starting to get possessed. And she actually almost uh, stabs Tom Selleck with this big-ass knife. St. Christina, yeah. And Tom Selleck, he loves wearing these shirts. I think he's got, like, three different color shirts with the alligator you know, right above his uh, uh, right right above his uh, uh, right nipple. Yeah, he loves those alligator shirts. <laughs> yeah, she's really ready to plunge that knife into him, right? <laughs> she she's more than ready to plunge that knife into Magnum PI. <laughs> it's like, how can you do that? Oh, her cross fell out off her neck. No, she probably, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, well, I'm a witch. I don't need this shit anymore. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> now, I mean, the rest of this is mostly just silliness. But, I mean, and see, and that's the thing. One of the big problems with this movie is that it takes itself too damn seriously. Like I said, I really wanted this to descend into grade z schlock uh and it doesn't do that this is more like a grade um more like grade w schlock you know it just um it takes itself too seriously it's it's stretched out to 90 minutes so that yeah okay well, when are the witches gonna get onto tom Selleck and everything you know it's <laughs> Think I'm going a little crazy. <laughs> well, I think you've always been a little crazy. <laughs> now just more so. <laughs> yep, Robertson. That's her that's his last name, Robertson. And uh yeah, he he just fell into the drink here. <laughs> So we are coming up on the 45-minute mark, the 45-minute mark of Daughters of Satan, and we are approximately halfway through the movie. And yeah, no, it's more of a shirtless Selleck in bed, and uh, she's uh, going to figure out another way to uh, dispatch him um, <laughs> by uh, using like this, uh, you know, this... You know, that colored smoke, you know, colored gas or whatever. She she actually, you know, puts something in, in the water right next to his bed and it starts, you know, puffing up all this, uh, you know, purple smoke and everything. I, like I said, it just, it, 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 it really feels like that Hollingsworth Morse was, you know, just taking this way too seriously. I mean, this feels more like a television movie. It feels more like a television movie that they decided, well, you know, we could probably drop this in theaters, you know. Something to purify the air, use it. Yeah, see, she, yeah, the, the housekeeper is actually pushing her to actually use it to uh, get rid of Tom Selleck. Oh, you know what to do. And honey, you better take off that cross. Mm -mm, mm -mm. You better take off that cross. You... You don't want to take any chances when you're uh, about to, uh, you know, unleash like poisonous gas on your husband. <laughs> I so wanted to enjoy this more. I really, really did. I really did. But 
like I said, this is more of a star and a half movie, and it's not quite on the level of like uh, you know other like grade C grade C movies of the same you know uh, caliber that came out in the '60s and the '70s. I don't know. Man, I might want to rather watch a Mano's Hands of Fate than this, but. Um, hmm. <laughs> just drops the cross again. <laughs> Tom Selleck is really, really uh, doing good, uh, doing well in terms of uh, pretending to be sleeping here. Because he's in this shot the whole time as she's looking into the mirror. And here again, I mean... The director just takes his time with these scenes. I mean, you know, this movie could have been 74 minutes. It could have been a 74-minute television movie and, you know, and all that. Like I said, I really wanted more of Tom Selleck versus Witches. I mean, I really wanted more of this. But, yeah, this is just... Uh, yeah. What is she actually thinking? Or who cares? <laughs> oh no, do I really want to gas my husband to death? You know, like he's staying on this shot for a long, long time. That Tom Selleck is just staying in the same position the entire time, not moving a muscle. But hey, we get to see his armpit hair. I mean, that's something. Look at those eyebrows. Jesus. <laughs> bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. <laughs> I so wanted this to be better. I mean, okay. <laughs> so actually, this is more like pinkish gas. <laughs> oh. How could you? How could you? You know, even Gene Simmons in Runaway wasn't this crafty, you know? <laughs> you know, he just had those spider robots, you know? <sighs> Have you ever been uh, poked by one of these uh, robots? It's really intense. <laughs> Like I said, Gene Simmons is epic in that movie. He is so epic. I mean, oh no! Now the room is too foggy. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Tom. You know, cough your lungs out right there. Yeah, so finally he decides, oh, fuck it. I'm just going to, you know, crash the chair through the window. <laughs> She's like, oh, no, what did you do? Oh, and, and now she pretends to, yeah, yeah. Now, see, I really thought that she, that he would have um, started to get on her, uh, started to get down on her here and be like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, or you know he could have he could have gone to the housekeeper and, and actually uh, went to her and find out hey what the fuck did you put on my bedside table you know <laughs> and where's the dog yeah where's the dog <laughs> Nicodemus you son of a bitch wake up. I'll tell you one thing. That's a groovy uh, 70s shirt that uh, Selleck has on there. And actually, I really like the belts he wears in this movie. <laughs> Pardon me for that, but he'd eat me alive. She's got some kind of mental control over him. So why is the dog being burned by witches? <laughs> Look, doctor, I'm climbing the walls right now. <laughs> so sappy it really is <laughs> or you know i think the perfect word that uh john over at twitter told me you know this is a, a tacky movie that that's the appropriate word to use this is just very very tacky 
but and that's the thing. I mean, aside from Tom Selleck, uh, you know, completists, or if you're a witch fan guy like me, but even then, I mean, if, if you're, you know, even with my witch fetish, this is a really, really low bar right here. A really low bar. I do like the red typewriter. That's that's weird. And see, I, I will be legitimate and say I, I do love all the artwork in this movie. I mean, you know, we don't just see the the witch painting. We see a lot of, you know, we see about maybe, you know, 10 to 15 paintings, you know, something like that. And, you know, they're all, you know, nice paintings. Absolutely. But um, still not enough to justify watching this. Although I got to give Shop Factory credit that the uh, the print looks great and it sounds great. Uh, there's no extras, but, you know, it does look great and it does sound great. Now, I think the uh, the critic over at Blu-ray.com, when he did this uh, Blu-ray review, I think he gave the movie itself two stars and a half, which, here again, slightly generous. Slightly generous. Oh. No, no, no. I, I saw... Blu-ray review somewhere else. But it's from Scream Factory. And, and you know, they're pretty good about, you know, visual and audio quality and everything. Uh, when did this Blu-ray came out? This came out in um, 2018. Yeah, this came out in 2018. Uh, where did I see that? Oh, was it a DVD beaver? Hmm. Be careful what you witch for. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, my sides. <laughs> uh, for the spellbinding thriller. What? That, oh, uh, that, yeah, he just, let me read the back of this. I mean, you know, I know, bless the guy at, at Scream Factory for trying to sell this, but, um, be careful what you witch for with this spellbinding thriller that delves into the realms of ancient covens and the conquistadors who loathe them. Uh, Tom Selleck delivers a, a commanding performance. No, no. I love Tom, but no, he does not give a commanding performance here. As uh, James Robertson, an antique dealer living in Manila, he buys a Spanish painting dating back to 1592, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the three decide to murder James as he may be a descendant of the conquistador responsible for the burning of the original coven. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Bravo. Bravo. Bet Tom Selleck wishes he was back on Myra Breckenridge being seduced by Mae West. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. In his first film, he played a stud to uh, Mae West. And, uh, oh, uh, of course, John and I know how, how old Mae West was at that time. Uh, she was actually... <laughs> she was like, what, 68? Oh, I thought she was older than that, actually. No, she was. She was actually uh, 77. Yeah. So uh, Tom Selleck in his first film played a stud to 77-year-old Mae West. What a business. What a business. <laughs> so, yeah, you know what? I think I'd rather watch Myra Breckenridge than this movie. <laughs> Wait a minute. Where is my copy of Myra? I know it's I know it's here somewhere. Um hmm. It's actually a DVD copy. Uh, yeah, it's somewhere around here. I actually still haven't watched it yet, at least not all the way. But yeah, it's somewhere around here. I think that. Yeah. Mm. Oh, but anyway, <clears throat> okay. So where are we in Daughters of Satan now? We are at the fifty-six minute mark. We are at the 56 minute mark of Daughters of Satan. So yeah, aside from the paintings, there's not much uh, there's not much else about this movie that I like. I mean, see, that's the thing. Look at that painting right there next to Tom Selleck. That's a gorgeous painting. The best thing about this movie are the paintings. 
That's really bizarre. Well, I do like his car too. Admittedly, <laughs> his uh, little red, um, little red car there. Yeah, time for a drink. Yeah, that sounds like actually like a great idea. Have some of my uh, Trader Joe's uh, French Market Berry Lemonade. Mm hmm. Mm. Uh oh. The witches are beginning to disappear right in front of his eyes. Now, is the wife going to disappear? Is she? There she goes. <laughs> See, look at Tom right here. He's just... <laughs> uh... <laughs> okay, this is not a commanding performance, okay? He's just standing there with the same fucking expression for 10 minutes. <laughs> uh... Oh. <laughs> I love you, Tom. I really do, but, you know... <laughs> And look, we all have to start somewhere. But yeah, I think um, I think I'd rather watch him being seduced by a seventy-seven-year-old Mae West. <laughs> I think I'd rather watch that. <laughs> oh no, she lost her cross again. Oh, it's not coming to you now, Tom. Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, your wife is now a witch, and she tried to fucking kill you last night. Do something about it. <laughs> Now, you know, here again, I must admit the last 10 minutes of this movie, I was wondering, okay, how is this going to end? Because there's a, uh, a question mark for actually, throughout the third act, we're wondering if Selleck actually survives in, you know, this most ridiculous of death traps that would be more suited for a, a third season episode of Batman, to be perfectly honest. But, um... I can I can hear Hollingsworth Morse uh, in the director's chair right now. But yeah, but Tom, when when you run in front of the camera, just make sure your shirt is undone. You know, make sure you, make sure you're exposing your chest hair and everything. You know. <laughs> well, you know, to be fair, you know, it's pretty hot down in the Philippines. But <laughs> oh, look at that old fashioned tape recorder! Wow. Mm -mm -mm. Now. Okay, what else am I missing? I, I don't think I've mentioned... So there's a few other things I need to talk about here. Uh, the writer of this movie is a man by the name of John C. Higgins. Uh, he was a Canadian-American screenwriter, born in 1908, died in 1995 at the age of 87. During the 1930s and 40s, Higgins worked on mostly complex murder mystery films including the Spencer Tracy flick Murder Man in 1935. During the late 40s, Higgins contributed to pen thrillers, including semi-documentary style films such as director Anthony Mann's He Walked by Night, Raw Deal, T-Men, and Border Incident. Higgins also wrote horror films like the Basil Rathbone, uh, Rathbone star uh, The Black Sheep in 1956 and an early Tom Selleck film Daughters of Satan. Higgins also wrote the science fiction film Robinson Crusoe on Mars in 1964 and the adventure film Impasse in 1969. That film actually had Burt Reynolds and uh, Anne Francis, uh, also a United Artists movie. Also a United Artists movie. Yeah. The Black Sheep, that actually looked pretty cool by the poster. <laughs> That has uh, Basil Rathbone, uh, Rathbone Ak Akim Tamaroff, Lon Chaney Jr., John Carradine, Bela Lugosi. God, what a cast. And this is also from United Artists. So, yeah, evidently he was a United Artist for a while. Hmm. Oh, and Tor Johnson is also in this. Oh, my God. <laughs> Tor Johnson from uh, the uh, legendary Plan 9 from Outer Space. Yeah, we all remember that film. And that film is a thousand times better than Daughters of Satan. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I could laugh my ass off all the way through Plan Nine from Outer Space, but uh, yeah, <laughs> this movie I only laughed maybe three or four times. Like, like I said, when Tom Selleck jumps over the bike, when he no, no, not the bike, but the horse, you know, like I said, my eyes popped out. Like, what the hell? <laughs> 
I guess that's what Magnum PI does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is he finally dead? Hmm. <laughs> And now she's having a drink with Tom Selleck here. Uh, uh, yeah, because uh, he saw her briefly in the doctor's office. Actually, the guy that plays the doctor, Dr. Dangle, uh, that is an actor by the name of Vic. There's actually two actors named Vic. Uh, but the actor who plays Dr. Um, uh, doctor who Tom Selleck talks to is uh, Vic Salayan. Uh, born in 1929, died in 1987, com commonly known a Filipino actor who is best known for his roles in Kiss Up, Kiss Up Mata, 1981, and Carnal, with a K, uh, 1983. He was born in Japan, Philippine Islands, uh, then a U.S. Commonwealth Territory from 1898 to 1946, hence all born in the Philippines, just like Guam, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, are considered U.S. nationals. He was a good friend of Manila Police Detective Investigator Lieutenant Vito Sebastian Ramos de Guzman, father of Florenti Randy de Guzman, a real a realtor in Orange County, California. Vic and Benny were peers in Nueva Ec Ija High School, and their messenger to do nasty things then was the actress Nita Blanca, a few years young, younger than him. They all eventually moved to Metro Manila. Vic is the father of Chat Salayan and grandfather of Victor Salayan. And he actually did a lot of movies. The first movie he did in 1950, American Gorilla in the Philippines. And I don't recognize any of these other films because these are all, you know, Filipino movies. Um, I've seen Filipino movies before, but I don't recognize a single, single title uh, anywhere here. His last film was in 1987 called Tiger Shark. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that was his last movie. The plot concerns a martial arts instructor who sets out to rescue his girlfriend who is being held for ransom by a South American warlord. Maybe that deserves a remake. <laughs> And uh, finally, the art dealer who gets killed, who gets um, stabbed in the stomach, uh, that uh, was an actor named Vic Diaz. Uh, more properly, uh, was a Filipino character actor who played mostly villains. He was the father of Teddy Diaz, the founding guitarist of the Filipino rock band The Dawn. Uh, Diaz's first part in front of the camera was an uncredited role as a Japanese general in American uh, Guerrilla in the Philippines, directed by Fritz Lang. So both Vic's in this movie, made their debut in American Gorilla in the Philippines. He appeared in The Big Bird Cage, Black Mama, White Mama, and played Satan himself in Eddie Romero's Beast of the Yellow Knight. He appeared in a number of other Filipino horror films in the 70s, such as Bloodthirst, Beyond Atlantis, and Night of the Cobra Woman. Uh, and he died in 2006 at the age of 73. Oh, and he was also in Raw Force, 1982. Yeah. And, um, okay, so here, <laughs> obviously she's trying to, you know, get him to come over to her bed right here. Uh, Tanny Guthrie is trying to get her to, uh, but of course, uh, here's another painting where we actually see the conquistador's face. Yep. December 16th, 1592. God, it looks just like me. <laughs> and then he looks again, and then, oh. Now, see, she may be in her early 40s, but goddamn. <laughs> looks just like me. Same name and all. 1592. Ugh, okay. <laughs> yeah, she's just basically sitting on the bed topless in front of him, and he... <laughs> And he's not really paying attention. He's just looking into her eyes right here. The, the man who got my grandmother pregnant was a wild Irishman. Uh, that may be the one memorable quote in this entire movie. <laughs> the wild Irishman that got my grandmother pregnant. <laughs> Why is it that every man who gets near me wants to paw me? 
Uh, well, he's not exactly pawing you. Okay, he's just kind of looking in your eyes, talking to you, because he's obviously not interested. Now, if he wasn't married, then why not, you know? <laughs> yeah, she's a total cougar in this. <laughs> total cougar. <laughs> Why the hell don't you tell me? And she actually bites him right there. She act, she actually bit his hand. <laughs> and that actually, to be fair to Tom, that looked like a genuine reaction. <laughs> that did actually look genuine. Probably his best acting in the whole movie. <laughs> and she loves raising her eyebrows. She's like, oh, I'll get you later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She definitely wants Tom's Selleck. Mm -hmm. Our satanic majesty's orders. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and she's got her whip. She Now, what is this outfit that she's wearing? I mean, look at this. What the hell is that? What are those lobsters on her breasts? What the hell? You know what? Okay, I've already done it once. I'm going to do it again. Just just, just look at this. I mean, there is a little bit of nudity, just to warn you. But look, just look at this right here. Look at what she's wearing. What is that? What is that? What, what is she wearing right there? Lucifer, our Lord, give us the power. <laughs> yeah, give me power. <laughs> And, of course, she starts to whip her. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> do you wish to be reconfirmed? Oh, yeah, I need to reconfirm my uh, witch membership. Yeah, yeah, I definitely need to re re reaffirm that. You will recite Lucifer's prayer. Oh, what, what are the words to Lucifer's prayer again? <laughs> boobies yep <laughs> hey you know i mean i just wanted to show what she was wearing i didn't mean to show off the nudity but what the hell you know <laughs> uh. bringing our daily this gift <laughs> what the fuck is she wearing god those look like lobsters a lobster you know what do lobsters have to do with Satan? Other than the fact that they're red. This purple and lobster outfit. It, like, who dug that up? Who seriously dug that up? Like, oh, this is what a witch would wear. Sure. Do witches have a thing for lobsters? Oh, maybe it's a seafood thing. Maybe it's a seafood thing. It's like... Well, we we eat our seafood, you know. I mean, you know, you Christians, I don't know what's up with you guys. We love our shellfish because Satan loves shellfish. <laughs> and, of course, they don't explain it at all. That's the thing, too. You know, she just wears this thing. Okay, now, seriously, Tom Selleck's wife looks like she just got sunburned. Maybe it's just the light. I don't know, but... Um... And they're finally covering her, uh, covering her up and everything. <laughs> mm. So, uh, so where are we with Daughters of Satan? Well, we are one hour and eleven minutes. One hour and eleven minutes into Daughters of Satan, and we have approximately nineteen minutes to go. Like I said, I mean, it, it's merciful that they made this movie short because it really is stretched out. It really is really stretched out.
<laughs> the wife is going nuts here. You are now recommitted and reconfirmed. Oh, and what do you know? They actually brought the coffin for James Robertson right here, 1943 to 1972. Excuse me. <clears throat> I think that might have been like a, a thing of drool that came out of her mouth, too. I must have missed it. I don't know. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, um, yeah. Now we're entering the third act here where. Um, the wife finally succeeds, or actually it's not even the wife. It's actually the, uh, housekeeper. You know, she actually succeeds in uh, giving him a, uh, a, a drink that makes him pass out. Hmm. All right. And, uh, see the music for this film was, uh, conducted and composed by Richard LaSalle. Born in 1918, and uh, <clears throat> and the score is okay. I mean, the score is you know it's you know it's appropriately eerie at times. But um, <clears throat> he was born in uh, Richard LaSalle was born in Louisville, Colorado. Began as a performer for local hotels, as a pianist and orchestra leader between the 40s and the 50s. In 1958, he joined the American Society of Composers and Publishers, in which he started his main career in film composing and uh he started out in 1958 with tank battalion uh the big night naked youth the purple hills deadly duo incident in an alley uh not anything that i recognize personally arizona raiders 1965 now i actually have heard of boy did i get a wrong number from uh 1966 that had bob hope in it bob hope and uh, elk summer and uh Phyllis Diller, and he also composed 40 Guns to Apache Pass, uh, City Beneath the Sea, 1971. Um, and in 1972, he actually composed two other movies, uh, Piranha Piranha, uh, which is obviously about, oh, it's a Venezuelan adventure thriller with William Smith. <laughs> And uh, the other movie he composed in 1972, which actually there's a trailer of it on uh, Daughters of Satan because it's also a uh, United Artists release. Uh, that movie is called Super Beast. And when I saw the trailer for Super Beast on the uh, Blu-ray, I noticed that Uni uh, United Artists had advertised it together, you know, obviously for drive-ins and stuff. And I thought to myself, well, you know, Screen Factory, they like to do these double features with no bonus features they could have just released daughters of satan and super beast together and they didn't do that it's an american horror film written and directed by george shank and starring antonette bauer craig littler harry lauder released on november 1st 1972 by united artists released as a double feature with daughters of satan it was the last film to feature harry lauder who retired in 1979 before his death in 1980 and it's also set in the Philippines. A doctor finds a jungle laboratory complete with mad scientists and uh, genetic engineering experiments. Uh, the doctor is experimenting on convicts, and once they are driven mad with the experiments, they are sent into the jungle where they are hunted down by the project by, by the project's financier, Stuart Victor, played by Harry Lauder. Pathologist Dr. Alex Pardee, played by Antoinette Bauer, finds out about the project is captured and held captive, but she manages to turn the tables on Dr. Fleming. In the Philippines, a desperate man takes an identity of a passenger, flies to the U.S. During the flight, the man becomes violent, and it forces the plane to land in Guam, of all places. I've actually been to Guam. Beautiful place. <clears throat> Once there, the man who has now become deformed is killed by security guards, Dr. Dr. Alex Pardee examines the body. She becomes interested in his condition and decides to go to the Philippines to investigate. Hmm. I'll pass. <laughs> I don't trust <clears throat> I don't trust any more movies by this composer and from this studio in 1972. <laughs> I really like that car. I don't know what kind of car it is. I'm the worst. Just to let everybody know, I'm the worst. 
person when it comes to identifying motor vehicles. I just, it's uh, cars have never been my thing. They've never been my thing. I've never been a gearhead. I've never, you know, worked on cars. I mean, you know, I, I can't identify them. Uh, this red car ha happens to have a boat anchor uh, on the hood. I can't really explain that. I don't know if he was just in the Navy or what. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. There's a lot of stuff in this movie that just, quite frankly, doesn't make sense. I mean, her outfit at the uh, at the uh, uh, recommitting, uh, recommittance for the witches or whatever. And, you know, there, there's just a lot of things in this movie that you just kind of scratch your head and ask questions. When really it's nothing more than a simple occult thriller with a future star. I mean, this could have easily starred, you know, anybody else and, uh, you know, a TV actor at that time. And nobody would remember this today. The only re uh, reason why uh, this film is known today is because of Tom Selleck, really. Now, see, this is bizarre. So what they decide to do, because apparently they want to kill him right at midnight, is they, they uh, put him in the passenger side of his own car. He's still passed out. And they put these giant ice cubes you know, in front of the back tires. Now, of course, they're in the middle of nowhere and the heat is obviously uh, scorching, although it doesn't make sense when they're waiting until, you know, midnight, I think, to um, have the ice melt. And then he's going to go over a cliff in the car. Uh, here again, this is a Batman death trap. I don't understand why they couldn't have just, you know, pushed him over, like, but they have to kill him at a certain time. Here again, it makes no sense. It makes no sense what, whatsoever. And finally, the three witches are together in this uh, Filipino bar, uh, whatever, as they, you know, just talk. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, Paralumen... And uh, the other two witches <laughs> together again. Dun 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 dun. I like the I like this guy's shirt too. Look at that, you know the green flower beds and all that. <laughs> like I said, the weird wardrobe choices. Really, really weird wardrobe choices in this movie. Oh, Mister Robertson drove off in a mad rage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This Manila galleon seems to have lost its poop deck. Ugh, 151 proof. Oh, oh, damn. <laughs> 151 proof. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's 1155. Oh, how convenient. <laughs> how convenient is that? So five minutes until the ice apparently melts at the right time. Here, see, here's Tom Selleck. He's about to see you see the ice melting right here. I just why, why, why the ice? Why can anybody explain to me why they insisted on putting ice in front of the back tires to let him have this? You know, he could have woken up any time during this. Well, you know, I might as well give it away. I mean, because I Actually, okay, to be perfectly honest for a second, I was like, wait a minute, did he get out of the car or did he not get out of the car? And, you know, we'll soon find out, but, you know, it's kind of all for naught. Now, see, in that shot, when the car is about to go over, you don't see him, you know. Oh, a Navy chief uniform. Oh, cool. I can't quite tell what the rate is on that uniform, but yeah, that's a Navy chief's uniform. Now, how did the car catch on fire? I don't know. I don't know. Like I said, there's a lot of things in this movie that just makes no sense. I mean, Leonard Maltin in his, in his video movie guide, he basically just said, oh, yeah, this movie just has lots of mumbo jumbo. Two stars. Yeah, lot, lots of mumbo jumbo is worth two stars. <laughs> That's literally all he says. It's literally like a 10-word review. I'm not joking. Now, actually, since, you know, we got about 15 minutes left here, what what is the reaction to this movie on IMDb? Because I think it got like a 4.7 out of 10, maybe. 
Uh, 4.5, actually. Hmm. Thirty-five user reviews. Oh, actually, let's look in here. Um, yep, film was released on November first, nineteen seventy-two, by United Artists as a double feature with Super Beast. Yeah, just after Robertson is chased from the antique shop, a poster for the James Bond film "You Only Live Twice" can be glimpsed for the briefest of moments. On an exterior wall. And that came out five years before. <laughs> a lot of the movie's background is similar to Tom Selleck, uh, Magnum PI characters, such as driving a sports car, taking place in a tropical setting, and being chased by a dog. <laughs> uh, let me see what some of these reviews are. A lot of sixes and sevens, believe it or not. Um, amusing curio. Night gallery, R-rated style. Uh, he left me rich with things, but I was hollow inside. Cheesy but fun occult thriller with Magnum P.I. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. That's all you have to sell this movie. That's really all you have. One out of ten. There were more chills in a Dark Shadows episode. Oh, I agree with that. I definitely agree with that. <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> two out of ten. Uh, oh, oh, this is John's review. Uh, John Syruga's review. I found it on IMDb. Two out of ten. Satan sits this one out. A young but still mustachioed Tom Selleck gets top billing in this tacky United Artists thriller that begins as a devil worship tale, but instead evolves into a story of ancient whip witchcraft coming between a present day wife and her husband with overtones of reincarnation and torture. An art historian in Manila visits a security shop and comes across a 370-year-old painting of three witches being burned at the stake, takes it home, hoping his wife will be delighted by the uncanny resemblance between she and one of the witches. Dumbbell Opus. <laughs> Dumbbell Opus does have some curious parallels to 1976's The Omen, a devil dog with 666 on his spike collar, and a mysterious housekeeper who has a forceful hold over the missus playing a slow-witted sap. Yeah. Selleck is fairly convincing, not exactly a compliment to the future star, while Richard LaSalle's melodramatic background score seems lifted from any number of made-for-TV movies on the same subject. Yep, I agree with all that. Yeah, and he gave it a star and a half out of four stars, which, yeah, he uh, John got it more right than Leonard Maltin, definitely. 5 out of 10, slow-moving horror flick. 4 out of 10, witchy woman. 2 out of 10, slow-moving, slow moving, terrible witch and painting film. Uh, 4 out of 10, it, do, it does not give the devil his due. <laughs> uh, fly out of 10, does a fly rest easy that's caught in the web? 4 out of 10, creepy but stupid ending. <laughs> yes. Uh, like I said, I mean, admittedly for a moment... For a moment, I was wondering, so did Tom Selleck survive? Did he not survive, you know? Five out of ten, enjoyable hokum. Four out of ten, Tom Selleck in Filipino exploitation theater. Yep, pretty much. Three out of ten, hilariously bad. Uh, see, that's the thing. I don't, it's bad, but it's not hilariously bad. I mean, yeah, there are a few moments, yeah. <laughs> B grade, but it is Tom showing up in a steamy location with a decent plot. Six out of ten, unsophisticated witchcraft flick is worth it for locations and young Tom Selleck. Uh, five out of ten, I'm a cat man myself. Six out of ten, all because of the painting. Three out of ten, drive-in mashup of Rosemary's Baby and the Portrait of Dorian Gray? I don't think I see that. I mean, yeah, Dorian Gray, there was the painting, but... Uh, yeah, that, that's that's a lot different. Uh, Jekyll and Hyde themes. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. I think all these IMDb user reviewers are really digging. They are really, really digging. 
Ah, this was the review I was talking about. Okay, this is this is pretty much gonna be the last thing I read. Now, this was over <clears throat> at uh, when M uh, MGM actually put out Daughters of Satan on DVD before the Blu-ray came out uh, in 2011, and this uh, review was written by Stuart Galbraith the Fourth over a DVD talk. Really good writer. During the 60s and 70s, producers of low-budget genre films sometimes shot their movies in the Philippines, where presumably these filmmakers could get more bang for their buck. Uh, a number of singularly Filipino horror movies emerged from the period, often starring American actor John Ashley and directed or co-directed by local Helmer Eddie Romero. While undeniably cheap and even shoddy, they were also surprisingly effective. The early ones have fleeting, if genuinely disturbing moments of shock and terror, while the later, more explicit ones are amusingly gory and over the top. Some of the same talent, though, neither Romero nor Ashley worked on Daughters of Satan, a somewhat classier, but also far less interesting horror movie starring a pre-Magnum P.I., pre-Rockford Files, pre-everything Tom Selleck, here pitted against the Manila Assembly of Lucifer, so-called Aubrey Schenck, have produced some good lower budget fit, but ambitious features throughout the years. And screenwriter John C. Higgins wrote some of the best ever film noir. Uh, Daughters of Satan, produced in conjunction with Super Beast for release through United Artists, wasn't a feather in either man's cap, and it was the last movie for both the writer and the director. Daughters of Satan has the kind of script that if you can't figure out the entire plot during the first five minutes, you're not paying attention. In Manila, James Robertson, yeah, uh, rather flatly directed by Hollingsworth Morse, normally a prolific TV director. He's probably chiefly responsible for the TV movie look of the film, which resembles an episode of Night Gallery. Yeah, yeah, that's why I agree with the other reviewer. This is like a this is like an extended R-rated extension of uh, Night Gallery. There are a few flashes of Filipino-style horror and nudity at the Witch's Coven inside a cave. But that's about it. Fans of these kind of films will recognize a few faces in the cast, especially fat, oily, and bug-eyed Vic Diaz as the antiques dealer who sets the plot in motion. He's a welcome presence in these movies, the Peter Laurie of the Philippines. Ah. The predictability of the plot and lifelessness of the direction render Daughters of Satan tame, and at 90 minutes, not 96, as it's stated on the box. Yeah, even on this... Uh, 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 oh, no, they got the running time here right. But um, in minor ways, it anticipates the omen. Aloof, menacing ho housekeeper turns up out of nowhere, hires herself to protect her sat satanic interests, keeps a big Rottweiler, a familiar around the house, and it growls menacingly at the protagonist, except right here. For horror and science fiction fans still mourning MGM's aforementioned midnight movies line, Daughters of Satan, lackluster though it is, is a welcome release. General audiences will want to skip it, but for genre fans, it's worth seeing once, so you might want to rent it. Well, I mean, if you can avoid paying money for it, I would say okay. But uh, yeah, and finally, even after he survives the whole car over the cliff thing, what happens, but the wife finally succeeds in stabbing her husband. So yeah, Tom Selleck actually dies at this movie. And here we have the credits. That's it. That was it. And that's why when this movie was over, I was like, what? Is that all? Is that seriously all? <laughs> and the director wants to zoom in on her face as she's having a couple tears here. You're like, oh. <laughs> I don't feel bad for her one bit. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, the witches get away with it. The, the witches actually get away with it. I mean, the other two witches fly to Hong Kong and uh, the wife, who knows what he's going to do, uh, she's going to do now. So uh, yeah, Cliff, uh, a fun one this morning, Stone. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, like I said, thank you all for joining me. Uh, ben Grimm, Cliff Booth, Jamie Hart, John uh, you know, love all you guys. Thank you so much for coming out. Saturday morning, Saturday morning at 1.30 a.m., I will be doing Night of the Lepus, starring Stuart Whitman, Janet Lee, and DeForest Kelly. And then Saturday night, we will kick off our uh, spooky sextet of Halloween horror commentaries. So I'll see you all then. You all have a wonderful day. Thank you for coming.